welcome to my little corner of the internet. As some of you may know by now, I recently brought home my service dog in training, Evie. Ever since I brought her home, I've been getting some questions from friends and families about service dogs. So today in this video, I am going to go over all of the laws for Ontario and clear up a few misconceptions. There are quite a few laws that govern service animals. The main one that we're going to be focusing on today is the AODA, which stands for Accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. This is the one that you're going to encounter most often in your day-to-day -day life when it comes to service animals. However, it is important to understand that there are also provisions in the Ontario Human Rights Code that protects you and your service animal. Throughout your journey as a handler, you may also encounter things involving the HRTO and SBT. If you want me to do vi separate videos on those ones or have any questions about those different sections and different acts and laws that have to do with your service animal, please let me know and I will be happy to do so. Section four of the AODA lays out the laws for the use of service animals and support persons. Subsection eight under section four defines a guide dog as defined under the Blind Persons Rights Act, and then defines a service animal as the definition in subsection nine, which can be super confusing. What they're actually referring to here is all the definitions under the Integrated Accessibility Standards, which is also under the AODA. I will link everything that is relevant for this video, all the laws, everything I'm talking about in the description down below. So once you find where they have this integrated standards with all the definitions, a service animal is defined as an animal that is used by a person with a disability to help mitigate their disabilities. In order for your service animal to be a service animal, you need to have a note by a health slash medical professional that is registered with one of the medical professions that they list. And I will put a screenshot of that list and I will also link it in the description. It also talks about how people on the outside can identify your animal as a service animal. So as a service provider, so that's anybody who runs like a public store or anything that's in public, there are two ways that you can identify a service animal. The first way is by the service animal having something that identifies them as a service animal. This could be anything like a harness, a vest, a leash sleeve, anything along those lines that clearly identifies and marks them as a service animal. The second way is for them to ask the handler for that doctor's note that we just talked about. Now, this does not mean that everyone can just walk around and ask you for your note. Pretty much only people at the front door and or like managers and people in those higher positions can ask you to provide your note for your service dog. So to give you a scenario of what that would look like, if I'm walking into a mall, for example, and the first security guard that I encounter asks me if my animal is a service animal and I say yes and they ask me for my note and I show them the note, that is perfectly okay and perfectly fine. From that point on, you should not be stopped every five seconds by every single person in that mall asking if it's a service animal. There should be systems in place so that people can communicate and be aware that there is a service animal in the mall. Because if every single person stops to ask you if that's a service animal, it can get to the point where it's a little bit harassing and make the handler uncomfortable. So basically who can ask you is the gatekeepers and then anybody who's higher up. So if we're again using that mall situation, it would also be okay if, for example, I walked into the Disney store and the greeter at the Disney store also asked me if my animal was a service animal. That's fine. But once I enter the store, it, not every employee, again, can ask me, oh, is that a service animal? Can I see your note? Oh, is that a service animal? Can I see your note? So it's just the people at the very front, the gatekeepers, and then if there is an issue, for example, um, a manager may also ask you to see your note, which is also perfectly okay. Once they ask you for 
your note. What is important to remember is one, they cannot take a copy of your note. So say for example, you frequent a Walmart in your area. They cannot say to you, oh hey, can we get a copy of your service dog note so that, that we don't have to harass you or ask you about it every single time you come into the store? No, they are allowed to see the note, they are allowed to read the note, but they are not allowed to take a copy of it, especially without your permission. And another thing that they cannot do is ask you any further questions about your disability. This is a major difference between the laws here in Ontario and the ones that are in the US. In the US, they go by the ADA and they are allowed to ask you in the US what tasks that dog does to mitigate your disability that is not allowed here in Ontario. You have the right to go anywhere with your service animal whether it is pet friendly or not. The only exception to this rule is places that would be a danger to your service animal or where your service animal could be a danger to other people. For example, a roller coaster would be dangerous for your service animal. So if you were going to Wonderland, Wonderland has the right to prevent you from going on a particular ride like a roller coaster with your service animal. However, they do not have the right to prevent you and your service animal from entering the parks altogether. And in fact, they should have policies and procedures in place to ensure that your service animal can be kept safe while you enjoy the ride if you so choose. One place that is really great at this is actually Disney and Disney World specifically. I have never been to Disneyland, so I can't tell you what it's like over there. And at Disney World, they actually have pop-out crates set up so that you can actually put your service animal in a crate while you ride the ride. And one of the cast members will, you know, keep an eye on your service animal while you ride the ride. And then when you come back, you can pick up your animal and move on with your day. Or alternatively, you can do something called rider swap, which allows, like, say you're with somebody else, you can go on the ride first while the other person keeps an eye on your service animal and then instead of having to wait in the line all over again for the second person to ride the ride then they can as soon as you come off you can switch with their service animal and the second person can then go on the ride next. An example of where your service animal can be denied because it may cause harm to others would be a hospital operating room or a burn unit. Obviously because an operating room needs to be completely sanitary as well as a burn unit and realistically like for example if you have a service dog a stray hair flying, for example, and landing on a burn patient can harm them, which is why they are not allowed in burn units and operating rooms. However, again, that does not mean that a hospital can completely deny you and your service animal entry into the hospital. They are allowed to restrict those specific places under other laws to keep everybody safe. This also means that you cannot be denied access to some place like a hospital because somebody else in the hospital has allergies or anything along those lines. That is not causing harm to the person under the law. Don't try and fight me on that one. That's just what the law says. That's different than a burn unit or an Service dog laws in Ontario are vague in order to be inclusive and not put an undue burden on the disabled. This means that it is up to handlers to follow the spirit of the law and not take advantage of the vagueness in order to push past where they should be or what they should be doing. It is also important to remember that every handler represents the entire community anytime they go out. I know that's a lot and I know that it's pressure on people, but it's the truth. For example, if you as a handler choose to pay one of those scam companies for a service dog ID because you believe that it will make your public access life easier, you are actually harming and making it harder for every other handler in the community. And yes, every single one of those websites that tell you that you can register your service animal in Ontario is a scam. There is no registration in Ontario for service animals at all. 
all that you need is a doctor's note written by one of the health professionals in, that are listed on the government website. So why is it such an issue for you to make the personal decision to go and get one of those scam IDs, even if you know it's a scam, but you just wanna make your public access way easier for yourself. Well, what you've actually then done when you use that scam ID is to make the people, the gatekeepers who are allowed to ask you for your note, believe that there is an ID. And then when the next handler comes along who only has their doctor's note, which is all they legally need, and they get stopped by the personnel at the front door and they're like, well, the last person had an ID. Why don't you have an ID? Your service dog is fake. And then they have a whole situation and drama and they are made uncomfortable because you attempted to make your life a little bit easier, but in making your life easier, you've made it harder for everybody else. Another great example of this is according to the letter of the law, as long as you have your doctor's note, your service animal, is officially a service animal. So according to the letter, letter of the law, you could technically go pick up your eight week old puppy and bring them into whatever store that you want because you have the note and they're a service animal. But obviously that's not only detrimental to the whole community because that eight week old puppy has no idea how to act or behave and is going to make everybody look bad because people are gonna think that's how service animals behave, but it also is certainly horrible for that puppy because you can very easily get that puppy overwhelmed and they can then become frightened of public access and other things and it's not good for the puppy either. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of following the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. Especially in the beginning stages of training, it is always important to do only the things that your service animal is ready for and be prepared to leave at any time and do what's in the best interest of the animal and always, always, always follow the spirit of the law. In Ontario, there is no distinction between a fully trained service dog and a service dog in training. Once you have that doctor's note, technically your animal is a service animal no matter how little or much training they have had thus far. However, there's obviously a period of time in which your service dog or service animal is still learning the basics of their job. Most handlers use gear that states in training. This is not required, but it is very common. And this is because when you use gear that says in training, it allows the public to know and understand that this service animal or service dog is still learning. They're not gonna be perfect, they may mess up, and that is okay because they're still learning and that people shouldn't put the entire weight and burden of the community on this animal or dog because they're still in the process of learning and it will allow people to give that animal some more grace and you as a handler some more grace. It also will help make sure that people don't think that your service animal is fake if they do mess up. But I also do wanna point out that service dogs and service animals are just that. They are dogs and they are animals. They are not robots. They will make mistakes, they will mess up. They are living creatures just like you and me. They have good days and bad days just like you and me. So we all as a community and society need to you know, have a little bit more grace and compassion with people especially right now during the pandemic a lot of people are staying home service animals and service dogs are getting very very rusty in their training because nobody is going outside like for example here in toronto we are still in lockdown and stay at home orders even my service dog in training evie hasn't even been to like a mall like a busy setting mall since november really when we first went back onto lockdown and I try and take her out to the grocery store when I can because that's really the only place that is open because she needs to learn and have the experience of doing that. But sometimes there is just so much time in between when I take her that she doesn't always do everything perfectly. She's also only seven months old and is still learning, but those are the only opportunities that I have for her to learn and to take her because literally everything else is closed. Everything that is pet friendly is closed. 
pretty much it's only grocery stores and big box stores that we can go to and those big box stores have a lot of people and sometimes she gets overwhelmed and we do leave but i'm just saying that we really need to have grace with people and handlers and service animals during this time because it has been tremendously hard for everyone esas or emotional support animals do not exist in Ontario. Traditionally, an ESA is an animal that provides comfort to a person by just being around that person. They do not have to be trained in any particular task. It's just kind of their presence helps their owner and they generally have a little bit more housing rights. They would also have no public access rights in the traditional sense. None of this exists in Ontario. I'm gonna repeat this for the people in the back. ESAs do not exist in Ontario. There is no legislation for Ontario that mentions emotional support animals at all. And even in the traditional sense, emotional support animals have never had public access rights. But again, none of this exists in Ontario. If you feel like an animal will help you emotionally and you choose to get an animal that is awesome they are called pets and they stay home if you are disabled and a medical professional says that it would be beneficial for you to have an animal to help with your day-to-day -day life and to help with your disability and they write you that note and one of the things that that animal does, along with its other basic training, public access training, and is able to act properly in the public, then it is a service animal. I know what I just said sounded extremely harsh, but that is just honestly how the laws are written. To help illustrate this idea, I'm going to use anxiety as an example. You could have mild anxiety. Um, overall, your day-to-day -day life is pretty uneventful, but there are certain things that make you, you know, get very nervous and anxious. Let's say like doing public presentations and, you know, you enjoy coming home to your puppy or your cat or your any other animal, your favorite, I don't care. And when you come home at the end of the day, you know, you snuggle up with them and that makes you feel awesome. That is great. In this scenario, that dog, cat, ferret is a pet. That person is not disabled because they have not been labeled as disabled and their animal is a pet. That pet has no public access rights. That pet has no special housing rights. None of those things. There are separate housing laws in Ontario that I'm not going to get into in regards to pets, but the point blank of it is that that is not a service animal. On the other hand, you could have very severe anxiety. Your dog alerts to oncoming anxiety or panic attacks, but you also enjoy coming home at the end of the day and cuddling with your dog on the couch, for example. This person has gone to a doctor, has, you know, had their medical team go over options with them, and they have decided that they would benefit from, them and their medical team have decided that they would benefit from their dog coming with them and helping alert them so that they can use that as part of their coping mechanisms when they're about to have a panic attack or an anxiety attack, or that dog can alert them before they have a panic attack so that they can take their medication for it, amongst all, a lot of other things. That animal, that dog, is then a service dog. I hope that makes the difference between the two very, very clear. You should always have a care team, a medical professional team in place when you are pursuing a service dog or service animal. The other thing that I want to mention about the laws in Ontario which are again a little bit different from the US is that if you have noticed throughout this video I didn't just say service dog I also said service animal and that is because like I said the laws in Ontario are vague technically any animal can be a service animal the most common 
animals are dogs and miniature horses. In the US with the ADA, the only animals that can be service animals are dogs and miniature horses. But in terms of the Ontario laws, it doesn't actually specify. So again, this speaks to like following the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. Technically, if you can convince any doctor to write you a note, you could have a service hamster, a service gerbil, a service anything. But realistically, if you were to have a hamster and also convince a doctor to somehow write you a note for that hamster, yes, technically it would be a service hamster and you would have public access rights, but what is that hamster really gonna do for you um, in terms of mitigating your disability? And is that hamster suited for public access? Can that hamster sit in a movie theater without getting lost, for example? Can that hamster come with you to school every day and not be in a cage and sit on a mat like all those things come into play so again that's what what we're talking about when we talk about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law it would obviously be pretty irresponsible of you to get like a service hamster so don't get a service hamster and also make sure you do a lot of research and have a medical team backing you and helping you through your process if you're pursuing a service dog or service animal. That is pretty much all of the basics of the service dogs or service animal laws here in Ontario as they pertain to the AODA. If you have any questions, comments, or need clarification on anything that I said in this video, please feel free to reach out to me either by leaving a comment down below and, and or sending me a message on Instagram or Twitter. You can also see Evie's journey to becoming a service dog on her Instagram. And I talk a lot about, you know, her her life, her journey, her training, service dog education, etiquette, laws on there as well. If you really enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing and comment down below what you learned from this video because it really does help this video get to more and more people. And the more people see this, the better it is for handlers in Ontario so that more people can better understand the laws and we can get a little bit less discrimination and have an easier time. I don't know how many of you guys know this if you don't have a service animal yourself, but having a service animal is a lot of work. Just going to a store or anything takes a lot more effort and a lot more time because it's not just you, you're getting ready, you have to tend to the needs of a living creature as well. So however we can make that easier by not being stopped or stared at every five seconds is amazing. So if you are an employee at anywhere, please send this to your boss. If you know people who you know try and pet service animals all the time, or even if you're a teacher, you can play this video in classrooms. It would be just so helpful to share this video with somebody who needs to see it so that we can help the service dog community learn and so that they can have better experiences out in the public. I hope this video was super helpful to you. I hope to make a ton more videos about my journey with Evie and I will see you guys again next time. Bye. Thank you.